All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kara Horowitz. I'm the executive director of our Emmett Institute on Climate Change and the Environment here at UCLA School of Law. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to our 2023 annual symposium, the first one we're holding in person since 2020. Uh, Woohoo! That's thank you. That's worthy of some clapping. We had to remember how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully the day will go okay. Um, huge thanks at the start of the day, and I'm sure I'll thank her again to our program manager, Heather Morphew, who has put hundreds of hours into this. So thank you, Heather. Um, I also want to thank our donors, our board, and the students of the Journal of Environmental Law and Policy, all of whom have given tremendous support um, for the event and to our program generally. So um, with that, I'm going to jump in. We all know we have a long road ahead on climate change. That's probably an understatement. Um, the thing is, we don't just have to travel the road, we have to build it. And can we get that done fast enough and without leaving anyone behind? That's really the question for today's symposium. Um, our needed transformations aren't just economic or political, although they are certainly both of those things. They also have to be physical. And in its most recent report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that rapid and far-reaching transitions across all sectors and systems are necessary to secure a livable future. So that's really our task. That's what's needed. And the question is, can we get there? Achieving this scale of required transformation and doing it quickly and without leaving disadvantaged communities behind is really our charge. The US, and it's tremendously difficult. The US, though, got a couple of important power boosts in this direction with the passage of two important bills in the early years of the Biden administration. So today's symposium brings together experts from around the country on the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which are together the largest and most important climate pieces of legislation that have ever been passed in the United States. They're big, they're potentially transformative laws, but how they will be implemented is key to whether we reach our climate goals. And as usual, who's at the heart of those implementation questions? It's lawyers. And so thus we're here at the law school today to talk about these laws and how they should be implemented. And importantly, what pitfalls there may be as we build this road to the future and how to avoid them. I'm excited to get underway today, and I'll do it first by introducing our fabulous keynote speaker. So we had been looking forward to having David Hayes in the room with us today, but because of a last minute illness, he's joining us by Zoom. I first wanna thank him for soldiering on in these circumstances. Thank you, David, and I'll introduce him. Um, he is currently a lecturer at Stanford Law and a senior fellow at NRDC. He's the former Deputy Secretary of the US Department of the Interior. And most recently, he served as President Biden's Special Assistant on Climate Policy. In that role, he assisted in developing and implementing many of the key climate provisions of the two bills that are gonna be our topics of discussion for today. And among other things, David is one of the leading experts in the consideration of permitting of energy projects on public lands and public waters. And he's here to give us his big picture view on these two new pieces of legislation. I couldn't be more thrilled to welcome him. I will say one thing about questions for David and how that will work. I will be monitoring, you guys may have seen that on your program for today, there's a QR code at the bottom of the printed program. We're gonna be taking questions via the QR code. So if you wanna scan that on your phone, enter questions into the uh, spreadsheet that you get through the QR code. I'll be monitoring those questions and um, I'll have an opportunity, I hope, to ask some of them to David at the end. And so with that, I'm happy to welcome David, who's now up on our screen. We can see you, David. Welcome. Hello. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, uh, Kara. And I'm so sorry not to be with you in person. Uh, Mr. COVID hits randomly, it seems, and at the worst time possible. Uh, but we move on. Um, let me just say at the outset uh, what an honor and pleasure it is to keynote this conference. Um, I've long been an admirer of UCA Law School generally and the Emmett Institute in particular. 
Sarah does an ex a spectacular job running the show and with faculty like your moderators today, Jim Salzman and William Boyd and so many others. And with alumni faculty like my former Biden administration colleague, Ann Carlson, who is obviously busy at work at the Department of Transportation and another alum, Sean Hecht, doubtlessly causing good trouble now at Earth Justice. I mean, this is an impressive place. Um, so today's conference, uh, make or break transforming U.S. Uh, infrastructure to meet climate goals could not be more timely. Uh, as Kara alluded to, the reality is we have in front of us a historic opportunity to transform U.S. infrastructure to meet climate goals. Thanks to all of our collective work, uh, with special thanks, frankly, to states like California that laid the groundwork and continue to lead, uh, to President Biden for his leadership and bullheaded commitment to the cause, and to the U.S. Congress, which, which, my goodness, actually finally came through, not without incredible bumps along the way, but cheers, cheers to the results. Um, so I want to make a few key points this morning and try to give a, a, a high frame to what's going to be a spectacular day here. Um, First, I want to click through the major infrastructure uh, sectors that are obviously the keys to climate success and, and why I'm optimistic about how the bipartisan infrastructure law working with the Inflation Reduction Act and a committed American president and administration and the states can deliver success. So I'm going to kick through the power sector, the transportation sector, industrial sector, buildings, and land quickly, and then close by talking about a couple of observations on transmission and permitting, two of the most salient topics of the day, uh, and, and um, obviously stress points that can stand in the way of the climate success that we need. <clears throat> so first, uh, turning to the power sector, we all know the history here, uh, including the Supreme Court's gratuitous uh, rejection of the Obama administration's clean power plan, which blocked an important regulatory pathway to decarbonize the power sector. So the administration, the Congress, and the co climate community writ large changed, or at least expanded, its tactics to adopt an incentive-based approach to accelerate the transition to a clean power sector. And the early returns are super encouraging. Um, there have been a number of analyses that show how significantly the bipartisan infrastructure law and the IRA together can transform the power sector. Uh, last month, DOE's National Renewable Energy Lab released the latest of these, and it showed the power of $370 billion in IRA uh, grants and tax credits. It projects that clean energy as a percentage of total generation could increase to over 80% by 2030 under mid-case assumptions. That's double today's 41% of clean energy in the power sector. Emissions would decline by 84% by 2030 relative to, 25, to 2005 levels. Bulk powers would come, uh, bulk power costs rather, would come down by 50 to $115 billion through 2030, helping consumers save money. This is going to be the hard part. Will that will that uh, that savings actually find its way to the electric bill? But also, premature deaths will be avoided in the amount of eleven to eighteen thousand they estimate, and more than half a million new jobs will be created. Now, this look at this sounds impossible. How can we <laughs> double clean energy production in the U.S. in seven short years? I, I think it's not impossible. Um, and, and the secret sauce, I think, is creating this incentive structure that turbocharges private investment in clean energy at a time when companies and investors know from their customers, from their investors, and from their employees that climate change is a deadly important issue, serious issue, that money can be made in producing and de delivering ever cheaper clean energy. And when you have the government de-risking the major capital commitments needed to transition by providing these generous grants and tax credits in the tune of over $300 billion. 
I offer a current microcosm in the power sector, the development of offshore wind as a new energy source that gives a sense to the level of private investment, collaboration at the federal and state level, uh, and with industry and communities that's flowing into clean energy right now. Now, offshore wind was heading in a good direction uh, before the passage of the IRA, as Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states in particular were committing to stretch clean energy goals, and they recognized the opportunity presented by the offshore wind resource right off their coast. And early on, the administration came in uh, and almost immediately committed to a stretch goal, 30 gigawatts of new offshore wind by 2030, all new. But the, the IRA came in then and turbocharged that investment with generous tax credits for wind energy developers, for manufacturers of turbines for offshore wind, and even for shipbuilding needed to service the offshore wind industry, all the way through the supply chain. It's juicing the entire system, backed by states, backed by union workers, backed by the federal government, which controls those offshore waters. And it's bringing environmental justice, equity, and economic opportunity for disadvantaged communities into the equation too, as I'll elaborate in a couple of minutes. So last month, the, the White House drew attention to a new report that includes some startling statistics. First, at the state level, long-term state Offshore wind targets increased 80% last year as California laid down a powerful industry marker by calling for 25 gigawatts of offshore wind generation. And Louisiana, New Jersey, and Rhode Island all announced new state goals. On permitting, the, the Biden administration remains on track to hit self-defined targets to lease seven new offshore wind energy areas by 2025, including the ones just happened in California, and to perform 16 project uh, uh, comprehensive EISs of, uh, that will generate 28 gigawatts of clean energy by 2025. Um, all told, private investment expanded by almost $10 billion last year alone for this industry that has yet to put any commercially scaled uh, projects in the water. Con the uh, construction is just beginning now. Meanwhile, offstage on the, uh, uh, with regard to clean energy, um, the regulatory piece is also backstopping this incentive-based work. While the administration and EPA in particular have been busy getting, getting undoing some of the Trump rollbacks, uh, the EPA has begun to roll out new regulations that will uh, reinforce the power sector's transition. We've got uh, the new uh, mercury and air toxics proposal coming out. Uh, we've got uh, cracking down on the cleanup of coal ash ponds. We've got the new good neighbor plan uh, in the Northeast uh, that will reduce ozone precursors. We've got new effluent guidelines. We're going to have a new replacement to the clean power plan, uh, probably influenced by the money going into uh, CCS. So we've got a regulatory backstop too. Then you move to transportation, and you're going to be talking a lot about that today. And what a phenomenal situation we're in here. Um, President Biden focused on this from day one, brought all the uh, major air, uh, major automakers together with their unions to talk about a commitment of 50% of new car sales by 2030, all being EVs. No one thought that could, could happen, it did. The idea is to leapfrog forward from these incremental uh, mileage standards to, to, um, electro, uh, to electrify the whole industry. And, and this was of course the, the biggest challenge we had in climate change. How do we get off our dependence on oil for transportation, which is the largest emission source in the country? Um, and then came those financial incentives. Uh, so all in the bipartisan infrastructure law, the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act combined to invest $135 billion to incentivize and build America's electric vehicle future. Everything from the charging stations, the electric school buses, the retooling of the factories, the consumer discounts, incentivizing secure mineral supply chains, uh, promoting US-based processing and batter battery manufacturing and recycling, 
uh, topped off by the president's invocation of the Defense Production Act to make sure that we get the materials we need to make this work. Industry has responded. They have invested already over, uh, committed, I should say, already over $150 billion to manufacture climate, or rather electric vehicles and their batteries. This commitment in the last two years alone. And here again, too, state and federal regulatory muscle is getting exercised again to reinforce this big move. Uh, EPA has granted California's waiver for the state's advanced clean, clean uh, trucks rule. Several other states are going to follow their lead. And today, of course, we're looking forward to the proposal coming out on the new mileage standards, which are going to uh, up the ante by recognizing that EVs now are a new technology that's available and should be taken into account when looking at fleet expectations uh, for our, our vehicles. Um, super exciting. Again, strong financial incentives that sync up with state and federal policy and global climate-driven trends with regulatory backstops. What a combination. Uh, then we look at in, the industrial sector. Now, this is, this is the hard part, right? The, the uh, steel, concrete, aluminum making, these industrial emission sources, which are very large and very hard to electrify. So how do we decarbonize them? Um, and of course, these are materials that are fundamentally needed for the building of the infrastructure that we're talking about, whether it's clean energy infrastructure or just the, the roads and bridges and, and uh, uh, the uh, other types of infrastructure that are at the heart of the bipartisan infrastructure law. So what's the strategy here? Um, a couple of, of strategies. One is obviously innovation. And here the big hope is hydrogen. So the bill comes through here, the bipartisan infrastructure law right out of the block said, let's invest billions of dollars in hydrogen and uh, DOE is on it. Uh, and last Friday came, uh, in came major proposals to scarf up the $8 billion uh, dedicated to creating these hydrogen hubs around the country. Uh, and it's federal money, but it's going to be matched and exceeded by private investments as well. This is exciting. This is a hydrogen is looks like a, 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 a potentially terrific way to replace fossil fuels when it comes to big industry, uh, big industrial uh, needs for energy. Um, there's also a stealth strategy that I want to draw your attention to on the industrial side, and, and that is... Um, uh, using the uh, procurement power of the federal government and of states and responsible companies to encourage suppliers to produce lower carbon uh, materials uh, that are needed for infrastructure. These are the materials that are, uh, are the problem here in terms of, of industrial emissions. Uh, did you know that four construction materials, steel, concrete, asphalt, and flat, gas, uh, flat glass rather, are some of the most carbon intensive materials accounting and that they account for nearly half of all U.S. manufacturing greenhouse gas emissions. And they represent 98% of the government's purchased construction materials. Well, the idea is that the federal government should ask their suppliers to tell them uh, if they are providing lower embodied carbon materials, steel, concrete, asphalt, et cetera, and to, and to preferentially buy the lower carbon materials. There's gonna be supplier reporting through environmental product declarations and incentives will be given to the, uh, the suppliers that provide those lower carbon materials. Um, this is not small potatoes. This is the military buying. This is Department of Transportation buying. This is the GSA buying. And they spent three, $630 billion a year in purchases. And here the Inflation Reduction Act comes in again. You may not realize it, but it appropriated $4.5 billion to the Department of Transportation and the GSA and the EPA to get put this structure together of the Buy Clean Initiative. So um, on to buildings. Um, I wanna tick through th three things that are noteworthy and have a, a, a bipartisan infrastructure law and IRA connection in terms of decarbonizing the building sector. 
Uh, first is that by clean uh, initiative, um, it's starting to reverberate through the construction industry. Um, I've had the chance to talk to a bunch of big construction companies in the last couple of months who are uh, getting pressure from some of their investors uh, and, uh, uh, and, and suppliers uh, to take up these lower carbon uh, concrete, uh, steel, and other materials. Um, uh, secondly, we know about the electrification initiative that is in, is key part of the president's plan. Uh, and uh, IRA has incentives here for heat pumps to electrify buildings. Uh, and the president's invoked the Defense Production Act to incentivize heat pump manufacturing. There's money available for the companies that are uh, transforming their manufacturing uh, and scaling up their, their heat pump manufacturing. Um, very important stuff. Also, there's, there's federal leadership in promoting modern building codes, uh, including energy efficiency codes. Uh, did you know that the IRA gives more than $200 million to the Department of Energy to promote the adoption of, of modern building codes? And FEMA uh, is, has promoted a government-wide incentive program so that communities that are receiving funds for mitigation of climate impacts uh, will uh, be incentivized to uh, uh, increase their modern building codes, advance their modern building codes, so that the rebuild will be better able to withstand the climate impacts that are continuing on their way. And again, the federal government is, is leading with their federal building performance standard that was announced last December. Um, amazing stuff, an ambition goal, uh, ambitious goal to cut energy use and electrify equipment and appliances in 30% of the building space owned by the federal government by 2030 and net zero emissions in all federal buildings by 2045. Uh, the DOE has a rulemaking to electrify all new buildings uh, undergoing uh, major renovations. And the state of California is joining the National Building Performance Standard Coalition, a nationwide group of 30 state and local governments that have committed to reducing emission footprint in existing buildings. The land sector, I'd love to talk about it, but I don't have time. So I'm going to pass, but I'm going to give a little commercial announcement. Um, Today, uh, there's a report out from my Stanford group on climate smart agriculture, which is uh, uh, incentivized through the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and if you Google uh, my name uh, and climate smart agriculture, you'll see an op-ed in the Hill this morning with a new report that suggests the importance of improving the measurement and monitoring of uh, climate smart agri agricultural uh, opportunities uh, so that we can make the most of that piece of what is truly a part of America's infrastructure. So um, I, I want to mention briefly that all of this uh, IRA money and climate spending generally by the Biden administration is rooted in the notion of, of environmental justice, equity, and community participation. And it's structural in the IRA. I think you know, uh, but just to make sure, that the ba ba basic tax credit provided by the IRA is is five percent, um, but I'm sorry, six percent. But you expand that five times to thirty percent uh, if two conditions are met: the project uh, supporting supported by tax credit is 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 paying prevailing wages, and it includes apprenticeship programs. The idea here is to expand the economic opportunity to folks who, who uh, and to make sure that there are good paying jobs, union jobs, there's workplace uh, workforce development coming out of this program. And then there are additional bonuses for tax credits made in America, domestic content requirements, a number of the credits will tack on a number, another 10% in credits for made in America. And, and a number of the tax credits will tack on yet another 10% for projects that are built in energy communities that are being left behind by the transition that have suffered some of the, 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 the worst uh, impacts uh, from fossil fuel uh, infrastructure and, and development. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's an incredibly important 
connection, a connective tissue here that the equity piece, the community participation piece, et cetera, has got to be part of this, as Kara mentioned at the outset. So what are the constraints? What do we need to worry about? Um, lots. <laughs> this, is, this is not going to be easy. Um, and, and your panels are going to be discussing some of the most important issues. Um, so I want to close by give, offering a few personal thoughts on two of the issues that are arising to the top of the conversation. Uh, one is the need for more transition, uh, transmission to facilitate the absorption and distribution of huge new slugs of clean energy and storage in the system. Uh, and the other is for the need for more expedited permitting to build the infrastructure needed for the clean energy transition. So transmission. Uh, we, we all know or are learning how significant the need is for new transition. I thought one of the most dramatic expressions of this came out of Jesse Jenkins at Princeton with the repeat project when he reported last year that 80% of the potential cuts in carbon pollution made possible by the Inflation Reduction Act could be lost if the U.S. fails to accelerate, accelerate the build out of its electric grid. Uh, the reality is that a lot of our uh, uh, renewable energy potential is stranded. Um, we do not have good uh, inter uh, regional connections. We need to uh, uh, improve the existence and upgrading of, of current uh, lines. So uh, he, he uh, concluded that to unlock the full emissions reduction potential of the IRA, the, the pace has to more than double the rate over the last decade to reach an average of 2% uh, or more a year in increases. And that's and a rate of expansion comparable to the long-term average rate of transition uh, additions over the uh, of the last 42 years. Um, and some of you read Sammy Ross' boiling point last uh, uh, Thursday uh, that talked about the California transmission challenges. It's a huge issue. Um, so I've worked in the federal government in a couple of capacities that have focused on this transition issue, transmission issues. I, I worked at the Interior Department on two lines that are finally coming forward this year, actually, the Sun Zia line in the Southwest, the Transwest Express line in the uh, Mountain West, bringing energy here down into Southern California. Uh, that Transwest Express uh, line is just, uh, the construction notice was just announced uh, yesterday, I believe, in fact. So why is it so hard to get these lines built? Well, I I'm gonna tick off a, a couple of the challenges here, uh, which, which, uh, don't start with permitting, uh, hello. Uh, first of all, historically, there's been no national government entity with the authority and mandate to identify interregional transmission needs and to work with states and tribes to identify lower conflict corridors where transmission should be built. Instead, we just left it up to merchant transition, transmission companies to propose lines, to make choices where they should go, and then hope for state and federal approvals and financing. There's no federal champion on the field with skin in the game to make those lines happen. And the system has been set up to enable states to block lines they don't like because state public utilities commissions are often captured by their utilities who view this uh, potential import of new clean energy as competition uh, and not as a business necessity. And financing has been a huge problem for interregional lines because unlike utility sponsored uh, lines that can be rate-based, interstate lines have to rely on FERC to allocate costs. And unfortunately, FERC has a very bad track record here. They're trying to fix it now, but it's slow, it's late. Uh, and that utility model, which is based on uh, a, a very region specific uh, rate-based model, again, is, is not set up uh, for investing in national assets that are going to uh, cross regional lines. So um, the, the biggest barrier to me for more interregional trunk lines is not, is not permitting, it's, it's executing on uh, this problem of the lack of, uh, of, of national imperative. Now, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law gives DOE new authority here uh, to do planning. For the first time, it gives it this authority, and it's huge. Uh, it's, it's something that was worked, worked on the transition that actually got into law 
It's not got neon lights around it, but DOE now has a new transmission office that has the mandate to identify the lines that are needed and where they should go. Uh, and it's incredibly important, and Secretary Granholm is on it, that DOE get their act together as quickly as possible. They, they have put out a draft national transmission needs study, uh, but they've got to work with developers, with states, et cetera, to actually identify the, the lines themselves to potentially plot out where they should be on a low conflict basis uh, and to identify them as national interest electric transmission corridors because the bipartisan infrastructure law gave DOE a second chance here to use that authority from 2005 to do eminent domain takings where necessary to on lines that meet these, this categorization. So I, there's a lot of talk about needing new federal legislation to clarify and consolidate this authority. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law actually has the bones of what's needed uh, if it's implemented aggressively. Uh, so I'm excited about the prospect here uh, and, and the appreciation of the, of the size of the problem. And I know our panel is going to get it all figured out. So I'm going to be listening in on that. Um, so on permitting, I just want to say a couple of things, um, a couple of quick points. Um, first, for big projects with a federal nexus, uh, I think we're doing a far better job now of consolidating federal permitting reviews, bringing all the affected agencies to the table early, permitting a single comprehensive environmental impact statement that covers all of the federal interests and hopefully the state interests, and using dashboards and other techniques to track timelines, ensure opportunities for community input. And, you know, I'm not just blowing smoke here. <laughs> the, we did this in the Obama period for major solar projects on the public lands in the Southwest. We had full EISs moving forward on big footprint solar projects with cooperation from the environmental community, from our terrific partner, the state of California. And these, these were permitted without litigation in 18 or 24 months. The same thing is happening right now in offshore wind. The federal government has their act together. The, there's a, a integrated interagency working group that is, is dealing with these multi-billion dollar projects that are being permitted off the coast of, Cal, of, of, the, of the Atlantic. Uh, soon we hope off the coast of the Pacific. Uh, they're moving forward in a transparent way with opportunity for public input. Uh, the uh, EIS process, 16 more big EISs will be completed in the next two years. This is amazing. Um, and all of this flowed from reforms that came out of the Transportation Interior Department in the Obama administration from the relationship with the state of California, smart from the start, and which were incorporated into law in 2015 in legislation called FAST 41 that created this thing called the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council, FIPSI, uh, an important federal uh, organization you probably never heard of. Well, guess what? The bipartisan infrastructure law made that FAST 41 legislation and FIPSI permanent and then gave $350 million in the IRA to FIPSI to continue to help improve the federal infrastructure permitting process. Plus the IRA gave many of the major agencies like Interior, Transportation, et cetera, hundreds of millions of dollars to build up their resources to be able to do the permitting. So before we think we have to blow up federal permitting, blow up NEPA, uh, let's, let's use these new institutions and, and, and the opportunities that they're providing and, and, and make it better. And the final point, uh, just to reinforce the, the point I'm making is that NEPA is not typically holding back large infrastructure projects. No, it's poor planning and citing decisions on the front end where project proponents or their state or federal backers, frankly, are, are not doing the job to learn uh, to identify lower conflict areas where it makes sense to build and where communities will be receptive uh, or, or, or at least uh, 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 
uh, not killing it. Uh, and we know how to do this. Karen Douglas is there. Uh, Karen and I worked really hard on this uh, with the Western Solar Plan when solar energy zones, we now have offshore wind energy zones coming out of the same concept. Uh, we need to continue to, to focus on planning, making smart decisions, getting communities involved, uh, and not depending on the private sector to do this and make good decisions on their own. Plus financing. Big capital intensive projects are tough to finance. That's why I'm excited about the new money from the IRA going into DOE's loan programs office and the $27 billion climate fund, the greenhouse gas reduction fund that EPA is going to be administering, which is going to focus primarily on getting clean energy infrastructure into communities, particularly disadvantaged communities. And wait for that. That's going to be exciting. We're going to be hearing more about that uh, as Jahi Wise and EPA roll out that program. So I've talked too much. I feel like the Federal Express guy uh, commercial, perhaps I'm talking too quickly, but I'm done. And I'd love to take uh, questions if there's any time at all, Kara. Thank you so much, David. So first join me in thanking David. That was fantastic. Um, and I do, I do think we have time for a question or two, and there are several of them here. Um, I'm gonna ask this one. So we've all now lived through several pendulum swings across administration that significantly affected climate policy. Again, another understatement. Um, what mechanisms exist in the IRA, this questioner asks, to prevent the next president and a future Congress from simply dismantling it just before the deadlines for meeting GHG goals hit? If any. Um yeah, no, good question. Uh, I mean, I am, so it, we talked about how incentive-based uh, this is, uh, the, the law, and, and the fact that uh, this is de-risking indus in private industry's investment, uh, these, these um, very generous incentives, tax funding, grants, tax credits, et cetera. Uh, and it's 10 years money uh, that is now available and that the administration pushing out big time ASAP and, and the, the beneficiaries of it are the pillars of American industry. <laughs> they love it. Uh, this is not a regulation that you can turn on and turn off. This is a financial spigot of, uh, upon which uh, uh, long, long range financial decisions are being made by the private sector they are not going to let a future Congress undermine their, their long-term financial commitments and undermine the, the, the future that they see. So, I mean, it's a brilliant and welcome benefit of the incentive-based structure and the move away from reliance, uh, the legislative side at least, on regulation as the technique for meeting our clean energy goals. Thank you. As my Irish mother would say, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> and thank you so much for your work on these bills and for joining us today. I think we actually now are out of time, but it was really wonderful to hear from you, David, and I especially appreciate your hazard duty this morning. Uh, so, my pleasure. So much. Thank you.